and welcome to this session. This is Professor Farhat. In this session, we would look as, at disallowed losses. And to be more specific, we would look at related parties, wash sales, personal to business use conversion. This topic is covered in an income tax course, the CPA exam regulation section, as well as the enrolled agent exam. As always, I would like to remind you, my viewers, is to connect with me on a professional level via LinkedIn. If you have a Facebook account, you like, please like my Facebook page and connect with me on my personal Facebook if you chose to. YouTube is where you need to subscribe. Please subscribe to YouTube so you're always up to date about any additional lectures. Like the YouTube, um, share them, put them in playlist, email them to friends and classmates. This is my Twitter account and I do have a website where I organize all my lectures via chapter and course. Now, if you're watching this recording, there's a good chance you are either a CPA candidate or CPA eligible or an accounting student. So if you're watching this lecture, what I suggest you do is you can view additional lectures, hundreds of hours of video lectures about accounting, taxes, audit, CPA exam material, thousands of multiple choice questions with detailed solution, simulations with detailed solution, textbook, audio lectures, electronic flashcards, plus others. All of those you can get on Jaeger CPA review the best valued CPA course, you will get 10% off if you use my code PMF. So let's start to talk about disallowed losses. The first thing we're gonna talk about is related parties. But what's the overall idea of disallowed losses? In taxes, we like losses. We want to have losses. We, great. we look for losses, okay? So the IRS will disallow, will not allow certain losses. Why? Because they, they think they are not being done at an arm length transaction or they believe they are being done within the same tax unit. So for the IRS, you know, they have something called something tax unit. For example, a family, a husband and a wife is the same tax unit. If you own a corporation, if you own more than 50% of a corporation, if you own more than 50%, you and the corporation, as far as the IRS concern, are the same tax unit. Therefore, you are related party. Therefore, if you incur losses, then those losses should not be deductible. Okay? So, we're going to first look at related parties and the section code is 267 if you're interested. So, losses on sale of assets between related parties are disallowed. Okay? For income producing properties or business property, any loss disallowed can be used to reduce gain recognition on subsequent disposition of the asset to unrelated party. Usually you have to wait a certain period of time, but here's what happened. When you sell the asset, when two related parties, okay, brother and sister, the brother sold the property to the sister and there was a loss. The brother cannot, no loss for the brother. Now, the sister sold this property to X, Y, Z, which is unrelated party. Then, under those circumstances, the losses can be used. Okay? So, the losses, any disallowed losses can be used to reduce gain recognition on subsequent disposition. So, when the sister sells it to the X, Y, Z, and you are assuming that brother and sister are related parties. So, I already kind of told you they are related party. When the sister sells it to the XYZ, she can use some of the losses to offset some of the gain, uh, but she cannot create a loss. She can offset it down to zero. Okay? So, only available to the original transferee and not available for sales for personal use assets. So, personal use assets, they're still... The, the losses are not allowed. So simply put, it has to be income producing or business property. So if the multiple choice questions on the exam says personal use asset, it doesn't matter what, whether it's related, not related, personal use assets, losses are not allowed, period. Okay? And only available to the original transferee. So the sister is the original transferee. Okay? Related parties. Who, who are the related parties? I already kind of gave you a hint, brother and sister. Family members ancestors like uh, uh, parents, grandparents, great-grandparents, lineal descendant, your kids, grandkids, great-grandkids, siblings, brother, sister. Notice there's no cousins, no uncles, no aunts. Um, this is the general idea. Also, corporation and a shareholder who owns greater than 50% directly or indirectly of the corporation. So if you control the corporation, then guess what? I'm sorry. You are part of the corporation. You are considered a related party. 
partnership and a partner who owns greater than 50% directly or indirectly. You guys get the gist, right? If there's a trust and the grantor or trust and a beneficiary, if there's any relationship, they also cannot take the losses. So Pedro sells a business property with an adjusted basis of 50,000 to his daughter, Josefina, for its fair value of 40,000. Okay, so Pedro realized the loss of 10,000 is not recognized. Also, it has fair value because they're related parties. That's it, the loss is not realized. Okay, so let's see what happened later on. How much gain does Josefina recognize if she sells the property at 52,000? If she sells the property at 52,000, guess what? 52,000, that's the gain. Therefore, she's, she's gonna be using the basis of her father, which is 50,000, and she's gonna get a gain of 12,000. Her realized gain is 12,000, 52,000, less her basis of 40, but she can offset Pedro's loss against the gain. You remember we have 10,000 here, unused by her father. She can use this to, in, to put it, to add it to the basis, okay? So this is how it works. This is where these, the, the subsequent disposition of asset will help that individual. I mean, cross out the five years. I'm not really sure if there's a time period or not. I believe it's five, but you can double check if you're interested. I should have double checked, but that's fine. How much gain does Josefina recognize if she sells the property for, for 48,000? Well, Josefina recognizes no gain and no loss. Here's what's gonna happen. Um, what's gonna happen is she's gonna be able to use her 10,000 from her father, but the carried losses can offset the gain and bring it down to zero. So simply put, here's what's gonna happen. Her realized gain is 8,000, but she can offset 8,000 of Pedro's unused loss against the gain. So she, 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 so she cannot claim 2,000 of losses. She could say, well, of the 10,000, of the 10,000 losses of her father, she can use 8,000, okay? She can use 8,000. That's it. And what happened to the other 2,000? That's it. They disappear and cannot be used again. They're basically gone. Okay. Note that Pedro loss can only offset Josefina's gain. It cannot create a loss for Josefina. One, one more time. That, that, that unused loss by the transferor can only be used to bring the gain down to zero. Okay. That's it. Cannot create a loss. How much loss does Josefina recognize if she sells the property for 38,000? Now she's selling the property for way less than the 40,000 basis. Josefina recognizes a $2,000 loss, the same as her realized loss, 32 less 40,000. Pedro loss does not increase Josefina's loss. So again, it doesn't increase it. His loss can offset only against gain. So that loss can only be used against the gain because Josefina has no realized gain. Pedro loss cannot be used and is never recognized. Note that if the property was a personal use property, not a business, her 2000 loss would be personal and would not be recognized. So if it's a personal asset, I'm sorry, it cannot, it cannot be used. It can, the losses on personal property cannot be used. If it's a business, then they can be used. So hopefully you'll get an idea what, um, what, uh, what, what related parties are. Let's take a look at this example. Let's take a look at this example. Marlon owns a land <clears throat> that she acquired three years ago as an investment. So it's an investment. So it's a business. So it's investment. Okay. It's not personal for 250,000 because the land has not appreciated in value as she anticipated. She sells it to her brother, Amos, for its fair market value for 180. Amos sells the land two years later. So forget about that five year thing. I'm, I was confusing it with something else. Okay. Explain why Marlon realized loss is disallowed at the time of the sale of her brother. So there's a loss of 70,000. Why is it disallowed? Because it's a related party transaction between a brother and a sister under section 267. Marlin cannot deduct the loss. Simply put, Marlin cannot deduct the loss. Now, would you suggest anything for Marlin? Well, we'll talk, we'll talk about that in section E, but can you think about what, what should have Marlin did? I hope you are guessing the right answer. Okay. Explain why Amos has neither recognized a gain nor recognized a loss on the sale of the land. Well, what happened is this. Remember, when there's a subsequent sale, when there's a subsequent sale, you can use some of the losses. But here's what happened. Uh, the basis, the original basis were 250. 
the land was sold at 180. Okay, so simply put, Amos will have this basis because Amos paid 180. Okay, Amos paid 180, therefore his basis is 180. But Amos sold it, let me see, Amos sold it at 240. So Amos sold it at 240. So he would not have a gain or a loss because the suspended losses of his sister, the unused losses of 70,000, would, would remove that gain. There's a gain here from 180 to 240, whatever that gain is, he'll be able to use his sister's losses. He needs 60,000 of his sister's losses, and those 60,000 would, would, uh, would, would eliminate the gain. So simply put, he sold the property for 240. The adju his adjusted basis was 180. He had a gain of 60,000. Then what he would do, he would say, okay, my sister had 70,000 of suspended losses. I'm gonna use I can only use 60,000 of them, therefore my gain is zero, and the remainder of 10,000 is lost forever. How does the related party disallowance rule affect the total gain or the loss or uh, recognized by the family unit? Uh, I just told you the 10,000 uh, of the realized loss that was not used is disappeared, is lost forever, basically. This $10,000 that's left from the 70,000 is lost forever. Which party wins and which party loses? Well, obviously, I hope you see that uh, in, in terms of the brother and the sister, the brother obviously won because he sold the property at a gain, but he used his sister's losses to offset his gains and did not pay taxes. So obviously, the brother financially is better off financially. Okay. How could Marlin have avoided the loss disallowance on the sale of the land? Well, can you guess how? Yes, I will tell you how. Don't sell it to a related party. This was an investment. Okay? Investments uh, investments can be deducted. Okay? So that's what she'd have done from the get-go, not sell it to her brother. Or, or <laughs> another way to do is to wait for the property value to go up again. But this is, this is beyond the scope of what we are trying to do here. But you guys get the point. Okay, let's take a look at this example. Sheila sells land to Elaine, her sister, for the fair market value of 40000 Six months later, when the land is worth forty-five, Elaine gives it to Jacob, her son. Shortly thereafter, Jacob sells the land for 48000 All right. Assuming that Sheila's adjusted basis for the land is 24000 what are Sheila's and Jacob recognized gain or loss on the sale? All right. So the first thing we're going to look we're gonna do a sh we're gonna uh, we're gonna work for a Sheila. Sheila sold the land for forty thousand dollar. This is Sheila. She sold it for forty thousand. We're assuming her adjusted basis is twenty four. Sheila will have a gain of sixteen thousand. All right. What are the recognized? Well, if it's a gain, that's pretty straightforward. The sixteen thousand is recognized gains are recognized the government wants their money they want you to recognize all the gain or at least you know if you cannot defer it we'll talk about that later but there's nothing to do if you have a gain you have to pay taxes on it uh, for Jacob okay Jacob let's see Jacob Jacob sold it for 48,000 so Jacob amount realized for Jacob is 48,000 the adjusted basis for Jacob is 40,000. Again, here we have it, 8,000 gain, and it's realized and recognized. So the gain is realized and recognized. Now, Jacob's gain basis of 40,000 is the same as Elaine. Okay, so notice it's the same as Elaine. It's the same as Elaine. Okay. Now, assuming that Sheila's adjusted basis for the land is sixty thousand. Now we're gonna work the Sheila. Remember, Sheila is the initial seller of the land. Now Sheila, she sold it for forty to her sister, and the basis. Now we're assuming it's sixty. Now she got a loss of 20,000. 
What can she do with this loss? Can she recognize this loss? And the answer is no. She sold it to Elaine, which happens to be her sister. Therefore, the 20,000 is suspended. The 20,000 is suspended. What about Jacob recognized gain or loss? Jacob sold it for 48,000. The basis for Jacob, um, because his, his mother bought it at 40,000, okay? And she gave it to him, therefore, his basis is 40,000. Okay? Uh, and remember, why did I use the 40,000? I want to make sure you understand why I use the 40,000, 40, 40, because we want to go back to the gift situation. When she gifted it to her son, it was worth 45. If the fair market value is greater than the adjusted basis on the date of the gift, we use the adjusted basis. That's why Jacob is using 40,000. In case you're wondering, view the prior recording about gift. So Jacob will have $8,000 of gain that is recognized. Hold on a second. Can't he use his aunt's losses? Can't he use his aunt's losses of 20,000? Remember, because the disallowed losses, they can be used for future sale. No, he cannot. The losses are his aunt's, and his aunt sold it to his mother, Elaine. Then Elaine gifted to him. So the only Elaine could have used the losses that were suspended from Sheila. Jacob cannot use them. So basically, those losses are basically lost forever. So Elaine is the original, what we called Elaine. His mother is the original transferee. And those disallowed losses were only eligible for Elaine. So if the same thing happened with Elaine, she could have, if that's if that's the situation for Elaine, she could have used the 28,000 of the 20,000 to reduce her gain down to zero. But her son can't do it. Her son can't do it. What's the point here? Proper, proper, proper tax planning. Another disallowed loss in which is wash sales. And what's the idea of a wash sale? Basically, wash sale rule is designed to prevent people or taxpayers from selling stocks at a loss to create losses than buying those stocks again. So basically, you sell the stock, you create a loss, but you really like the stock, you buy it again. So what is basic, the basic idea of a wash sale? Simply put, if you create a trade and you created a loss. Let's assume this was um, October 21st. Then guess what? You cannot, re you cannot have replaced this stock. So you cannot have purchased that stock within 30 days before and 30 days after. That's basically the idea. That's the simple idea. There's a lot of rules to it, but the idea is you cannot create losses. Just sell the stock, then re repurchase it. If you don't like the stock, sell it. Don't, don't buy it within 30 days before or 30 days after. Now, if you buy it here, then your loss will be recognized if you buy it outside the period, okay? So that's that's the basic idea. So losses from wash sales are disallowed. So what happened if they were disallowed? So do they go away? Do, the, do these losses go away? Not really, if you, if you buy the stock, the loss will be added to your new purchase, to the cost basis of your new purchase. So wash sale occurs when a taxpayer disposes sells of a stock or security at a loss and acquires substantially identical stock or securities within 30 days before or after the date of the loss sale. So we're not going to talk about if it's identical or the same, because we're going to assume it's the same. So you bought Apple again after you sold it at a loss. Now what happened to the disallowed losses? If you bought it again, disallowed losses is added to the basis of the substantially identical stock or securities that caused the disallowance. So if you could, if there was a loss, you will take this loss. You cannot deduct it. You will take this loss and you add it to the to the purchase of the new of the new stock. Then when you sell that new stock, assuming you don't sell it again within the disallow the disallowance period, then you can take the loss. Okay. Do not apply gains to realize on the disposition of securities. Of course, if there is a gain, you pay the taxes and the IRS does not have any issue with that. Okay, Let's take a look at an example. On December 15th, Kathy sold 300 shares of electronics, a publicly traded company, at a loss of 2500 Okay, that's fine. So, this is December the 15th, and there was a loss of 2500 but what Kathy did on January 5th, 
this is the 30 day period so I'm gonna say January 15 on on January 5th she bought it back Cattery purchased the 300 shares she cannot deduct the loss so this is basically what happened this is like as simple as it gets let's take a look at another example Jackie made the following acquisition of ABC company January 15 2018 300 shares at $50 February 1st, 2018, 200 shares at $30, okay? To offset other capital gains, Jackie sells 500 shares of ABC company for $25 on December 15th, 2018. So what happened is this. On December 15th, let me, okay? So this is December 15th. December 15th, she sold 500 shares at a loss. They don't, they don't tell us how much is the loss, but they told us to offset capital gains. That means she sold them at a loss. Sold 500 shares. And that was 12.15. Now, here's the rule. If she sold the shares at $500 at a loss, she cannot have bought them 30 days before, and she cannot rebuy them. Basically, she, she cannot have bought them November the 15th, within November the 15th, or... January the 15th so she if she sold them at a loss that's fine but 30 days before 30 days after she cannot buy those shares um, because she believe ABC is a good investment she buys 600 shares on January 5th I'm sorry if that's the case actually yes yeah, she bought 600 shares her losses from December the 15th is a wash sale let's assume the losses were a thousand dollar just for the sake of illustration, this one thousand dollar will will be added to her cost basis of the six hundred shares. Let's assume she paid uh, three thousand dollar for the six hundred shares. Now we assume she paid four thousand dollar for those shares. Okay, because she repurchased identical stock, Jackie cannot deduct the losses on the blocks of the stocks. She should have waited after January the fifteenth. She should have waited, which she did bought some shares, but she shouldn't have bought the shares on January fifth. This is another map, kind of hopefully it will help you with this wash sale rule. Again, we're, we're, we're simplifying things here. There are many rules for this wash sale rule. For example, if you have a different account, um, it's, it's counted the same. If your spouse, if you control another account at a corporation, the wash sale rule will, will trigger. But we don't want to go into those details, just the overall idea. I'm giving you the overall idea. You purchase 100 shares of ABC company costing $2,000 January 2nd. On May 1st, sold the 100 shares at a price of 1,200. What do you have? You have a gain. If you have a gain, we don't have to worry about anything. It's, it's a gain. If you sold them at a loss, okay? And if you have a loss, if you sold the 100 shares and you have a loss of 800, and let's see what happened next. Then you have a loss. If you purchase 100 shares of ABC company at a cost of 1,400 on June 5th, basically, um, June 5th, remember, May 1st, you have 30 days till, you know, June 1st, June 1st. If you bought the shares back at June 5th, there's no wash sale because you are more than 30 days. Assuming if you bought the shares May 14th and you purchase 100 shares of 1400, guess what's going to happen? This $800 loss, you can no longer take it. It's going to be added to the cost of the new shares. The $800 loss for the May 1st sale is this allowed. The basis of the May shares will be $2,200, which is $1,400, what you paid, plus the disallowed losses. And the holding period for the shares will begin January 1st. And we assume the holding period, assuming you haven't sold those shares. Okay. So here's there's no wash sale in this in this scenario. The loss from May sale is allowed. The basis of the shares in your new purchase is fourteen hundred, and the holding period began on June fifth because this is when you actually bought the shares. So again, this is basic rules. I would say basic. It means there are many much more to it than the base. This allowed losses, which is um, what happen if you convert your personal property to business property. Now remember. If you have a personal property, you cannot deduct any losses on personal property. So the next thing you will think, well, why don't I convert this personal property into a business property, then sell it and realize the loss? Nope, you can't do that. The IRS, they'll have specific rules that you cannot convert the personal into business, then take the losses. So personal use assets, we all know this. 
Lost on disposition of personal use asset is this allowed? Just make sure you know this. It makes your life much easier in future chapters. Personal use asset cannot be converted into business, into a business use deductible loss. I mean, you can convert your personal use property to a business, but you're not going to be able to convert convert the loss. Okay. So here's what's going to happen. The original loss basis for an asset converted is the lower of. So what they do, they would say, okay, when you convert your basis is the lower of the personal use basis or the fair market value. So you would look at your fair market value and your basis, and you will choose the lower of the two. And what's going to happen when, when you do so, you're going to have dual basis. If you remember the gift rules, then you're going to have something like the gift rule. So if you don't know the gift rules, please go back and review that session because I'm going to assume you know what how the gift rules work. Now, for ba basis for loss is basis for the depreciation. This is different than the gift rules. So when you depreciate the new asset, it's the basis for the loss. Whatever the loss is, the basis for the loss will be the basis for the depreciation, which is not the same for the gift rules. Okay. So simply put, you cannot recover personal loss via larger depreciation. They don't allow you the larger basis. So if they allow you a larger basis, then your depreciation is higher. So you would recapture those personal use losses through depreciation. Now, for depreciation purposes, you would use the lower basis, the basis for the loss. Okay? And let's take a look at a few examples to kind of illustrate this point, but hopefully you are familiar with it from the gift, from the gift the basis chapter. Diane Personal Residence has an adjusted basis of 175000 and a fair market value of one sixty. So before we proceed, let's remember the fair market value is lower than the adjusted basis. What does that mean? This is going to trigger what we call the dual basis. Diane converts the personal residence to a rental property. Her basis for the loss, if she sells the property at a loss, her basis is one sixty. the lower of one seventy five. And uh, 160, the fifteen thousand dollar decline in value is a personal loss and can be and can never be recognized for tax purposes. Diane's basis for the gain is 175. Let's go back and kind of sh hopefully you'd remember what I did. So basically, the basis for the property is 175. Okay, and the fair market value is 160. So the fair market value was below was below the basis. This is the basis. And remember what's going to happen in the gift rule. The gift rule, if you sold it at a gain, if you sold it more than 175, the closest line is your basis. If you sold it at a loss, the closest line, the 160, is your basis. Same concept applies here. Same exact concept. Let's take a look at another example. At a time when his personal residence adjusted basis 140 worth 150, Keith converted one half of his rent of it to rental use. Now hold on a second. Let's before we proceed, here we have a fair market value when it was converted because this is important. Fair market value that's greater than the adjusted basis. So 150 is greater than 140. Okay. For simplicity, assume that property is not covered by makers, will be depreciated using the straight line method just for simplicity purposes. Assume a 20 year life and no salvage value. As a result, annual depreciation for this property is 3,500. Okay, that's fine. After renting the converted portion for five years, Keith sells the property for 144, all amount related only to the building. Assume that the land has been accounted for separately. That's fine for simplicity as well. So here's what happened. Now the, the property is basically Half of it is rental, half of it, half of it is personal use. His personal use property, the basis is 70000 Okay, so the original basis is half of 140. For rental, the original basis is also 70. Now, why 70? Because the fair market value was greater than the adjusted basis when the conversion occurred, therefore, the basis is 70. Now, for the personal property, there is no depreciation, so the adjusted basis is 70. If they sold it for 144, half of 144 multiplied by 2 equal to 72,000, therefore the proceeds are 72. Therefore, on the personal use property, Keith will have a gain of 2,000. For the rental property, the basis, we're starting with 70,000 minus the depreciation taken for five years will give us the adjusted basis of 52,500. The amount realized is 72, therefore the gain is 19,500. Okay, so they have a gain on the personal use and gain on the uh, rental portion of it. 
Assume the same fact in the previous example, except that the fair market value on the date of the conversion was 140. Remember, fair market value now is 130 less than the adjusted basis of 140. And the sale proceeds happen to be 90,000. So here's what happened now. Um, if the personal use property, it's still going to be 70,000. It doesn't matter for the personal use. 70,000 and the amount realized is 45 because we sold it for 90,000 divided by 2. 50% is 45,000. So for the personal use, he had a loss of 25,000. What can Keith do with this loss? Nothing. He cannot do anything. For the rental property, notice the original basis now is 65,000. Why? Because when it was converted, the fair market value was lower than the adjusted basis. Therefore, we use the lower of the two. So once 130 divided by two will give us a basis of 65,000. Then we depreciate it for five years. This is the depreciation, how we computed the depreciation. This is the adjusted basis at the date of sale. We received 45,000. We have a loss and this loss is deductible because it's basically an investment uh, investment property. So the loss is deductible. Let's take a look at one more example. As personal residency originally cost 340,000. After living in the house for five years, he converted to rental property. At the date of the conversion, the fair market value of the house is 320. All right, so fair market value is lower than adjusted basis. Fair market value 320 is lower than the adjusted basis of 340. Now, if we sold, what's the, uh, as, to, as to the rental property, calculate the basis for a loss. Again, very similar, very similar to the gift. Let me do it here one more time. So the basis, the original basis were 340. The fair market value is 320. If we sold it at a loss, if we sold it at a loss, if we sold it here, the closest thing to this line is the fair market value. Therefore, the basis will be 320. Depreciation. The basis for depreciation is the same thing as the basis for the loss, which is, which is 320. Because they don't want you to, they don't want, they don't want a basis of 340. A basis of 340 for depreciation will give you more depreciation. Therefore, you will take the lower. And what happened if he sold the property at a gain? If he sold the property again, means more than 340, the basis will be considered 340. So if he sold it here, the closest thing is 340. Could, uh, could this individual have obtained better tax result if he had sold his personal residency for 320 and then repurchased another house for 320 to hold as a rental property? What do you think? Can, can we do that? And the answer is no. If it was a personal property and you sold it, you're going to take a $20,000 loss. It's not allowed. Remember, personal use assets, losses are not allowed. So not really, no, you cannot, you cannot, uh, you cannot uh, undertake this strategy. If you have any questions, any comments about this topic, please email me. If you're studying for your CPA, make sure you study hard. If you go, if you visit my website for additional lectures, 